Good evening, this is Viewpoint. I'm Zaka Jacob. The Dalai Lama, the holiest of holy monks for the Tibetan Buddhists, was in Jammu today. He's en route to Ladakh. This is the first time that he's visiting Ladakh in more than two years. And it comes just ahead of the 16th round of core commander talks between India and China. That's due to happen on the 17th later this week. The Dalai Lama today in comments in Jammu said that he's not against the Chinese people and that he's only trying to protect the Tibetan culture. Will this send a strong signal to Beijing ahead of the party congress that is due later this fall? Chinese now realize the Dalai Lama uh, not seeking independence, uh, but within China, within people's world of China, uh, it's meaningful autonomy. Remember, this comes just on the back of the Prime Minister wishing the Dalai Lama just a few days ago on his birthday. How may Beijing respond? Let me now go across. We're opening this up to our full panel of guests. Uh, General Retired VP Malik, former Chief of Army Staff. Uh, Ambassador Anil Trigunyat, former diplomat, will be joining us. Aina Tanjan uh, is a political affairs commentator joining us from Beijing. And Dr. M.S. Pratibha, Associate Fellow at the IDSA, will also be joining us. Uh, General uh, let me start with you first, because uh, this comes just a few days, General Malik, before the core commanders meeting that's going to happen, uh, I think, on Sunday, either Saturday or Sunday, on the 17th, I believe. Uh, and it's going to be the 16th round of core commanders' talks. Uh, the fact that the Dalai Lama has, is going to Ladakh, and the, the, the very raise, reason for why the Chinese attacked eastern Ladakh was because of the abrogation of 370, and they believe it's disputed, so on and so forth. How do you think the Chinese... Uh, could likely respond to the Dalai Lama visiting Ladakh. Good evening, Dhaka. Firstly, uh, I must mention here that Dalai Lama's visit to Ladakh was uh, fixed and arranged long before the Chinese agreed to have 16th round of talks at the military level in Ladakh. So what had been arranged earlier for Dalai Lama to visit Ladakh, that came much earlier than the uh, talks which are going to take place uh, on Sunday. Uh, as far as these talks are concerned, let me also mention that uh, we've had 15 rounds earlier and there has been no genuine progress really for the last two years. Mm -hmm. And our troops on both sides, nearly 60,000 uh, troops on either side, they continue to face each other. And there has been absolutely no uh, progress as far as vacation of uh, our uh, patrolling point 15 in Konkala, our Depsang, uh, Depsang plain, or uh, the uh, position in Demchok, these have not changed. They have not agreed to vacate these. So there has been no progress. And as far as I'm concerned, I think we've seen enough of bullying and uh, appeasement of the Chinese, bullying from the Chinese side and appeasement. Okay. I think we have to look at this visit in a larger perspective than just military to military level talks. Of course. And uh, therefore, uh, I think uh, there is, uh, if there is any reaction, let that be. I think we can face that. Uh, I also want to go across to Ambassador Anil Trigonyat. Uh, you know, this is coming not in isolation, as General Malik said. Uh, we had just a few days ago the Prime Minister wishing Dalai Lama publicly, uh, so, you know, something that uh, Prime Ministers previously never used to do. Uh, you have uh, now the core commanders uh, meeting that's coming up uh, uh, on this weekend. Uh, is there a sense that India is now being more assertive with allowing the J Dalai Lama to go and visit Ladakh just ahead of those talks? India is being more assertive vis-a-vis -vis Beijing, uh, perhaps because it's realized that mollycoddling is not working, or perhaps there's also frustration that uh, we've had, what, now 15 rounds of co-commander talks and not much progress has happened. 
No, you are so right. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it is time that if we are not doing it, we ought to be doing it. But during these Galwan clashes, as you know, since then, India has shown to the Chinese that it can stand up to it at every fora and on the front. And therefore, the Chinese do understand very well. Now, these talks also became uh, a continuation after uh, Dr. Jay Shankar and Wang Yi met in, on the sidelines of the G20 uh, recent meeting yeah. of the foreign ministers. But uh, I think that they all, and India has very clearly said that it has to be a package deal and that they have to vacate on the promise, on the places where they are and go back to the normal, whatever agreements have been done. But as far as China is concerned, you know, I mean, they should be the last one talking about this, whether it is Dalai Lama visit to Ladakh or whether uh, anything else that we do within our own country, whether on the G20, where we're going to hold those meetings, is our prerogative. So China absolutely has no say. Of course, they'll continue to make noises. And as far as this is concerned, you know that uh, the Dalai Lama has just said that he wants his autonomy. And rightly so. I mean, Correct. since 1950, uh, the, since uh, the, the CPC or the China Chinese PLA, really went into Tibet and forcibly occupied it. So that remains an unsettled issue. India does not talk about it because we still believe in one China policy, but then they don't believe in one, one India policy because they all all the time sure. keep, uh, they are sitting on our territory of Jammu and Kashmir, which was parceled out to them by the Pakistani. They are sitting in Ladakh. They have been intruding everywhere, wherever they can. So borders have not been settled. So as far as India and China are concerned, I think they are they will be advised better not to talk about these things. Okay, I, I want to go across go to uh, Einar Tanjan as well. Uh, interestingly, the comments that uh, the Dalai Lama made uh, when he was in Jammu today, he said, I'm not against the Chinese people and the Chinese people are not against me. Uh, what I'm seeking is merely autonomy, not independence uh, from the People's Republic of China. How may these comments be viewed uh, by the Chinese state in particular and the Chinese people? Well, the Dalai Lama has uh, long been an advocate for some sort of independence for uh, Tibet. Uh, that's, you know, he's outside of China. Uh, China uh, repudiates that. Uh, India's already agreed twice that uh, uh, Tibet is part of China. Um, he, you know, as I said, he can say what he wants. Uh, obviously, the political establishment wants, wants to enlarge the playing field uh, by throwing Tibet into the uh, mix. But I don't think that it'll necessarily help with uh, any kind of settlement of border issues. At this time, uh, needling China or China needling uh, India is, is not constructive. I think the best way is to reestablish trust. If you can do that, uh, then there can be some progress. But at this juncture, after a number of years, uh, trust is very short. Uh uh, I don't know if you've seen these comments from Kevin Rudd, the former Australian Prime Minister, and he, as you know, uh, Mr. Tangent is a big Sinophile. Uh, he said recently to an Indian newspaper that he expects Xi Jinping to make some dramatic gesture uh, to reach out to India. He didn't go on to explain why, but uh, many commentators are suggesting that before the, uh, before the 20th Party Congress, which happens later this year, uh, Xi Jinping would want to settle uh, this, this ongoing situation in eastern Ladakh, uh, which has been going on for the better part of the last couple of years now. Well, I, I think that's probably a mistake. I mean, the, the Beijing government tends to be long on planning. They're very cautious. They like to uh, play out every scenario uh, before they do something. And they're not the kind of you know, establishment that just one man makes a decision and tries to uh, do something. I mean, this, this has to be a collective decision. Um, it would not be seen well uh, within China or around the world if it's just, you know, some sort of arbitrary uh, uh, gesture. So I, I, I don't. I, Kevin is uh, yes, uh, very informed. Uh, he was uh, prime minister of Australia, but I don't necessarily know that that's correct. Uh, I haven't okay. seen anything or heard anything. Uh, Dr. Pratibha uh, tracks China ties very closely. Uh, when I spoke to Dr. Jay Shankar a couple of weeks back at the CNN News 18 town hall, uh, he said, "I don't care how many rounds it takes, 15 or 20 or 100 rounds." but we can't compromise on our sovereignty. But at the same time, uh, Dr. Pratibha, is there a sense of frustration, if you will, for want of a better word, that we've had 15 rounds of talks and all of these uh, friction points have not been resolved? Um, I would like to say that these are my personal views. 
uh, it doesn't reflect uh, government of India or the institute sure. that yeah. I work. Uh, see, the, there is commitment to talk to Chinese about the border issue and persist with the Chinese. Uh, I think there are understanding that these are going to take some time, but I think the frustration comes with in the understanding that China cannot view whatever is happening in the international system as something can make India-China relations normal. So I think the 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 Jay Shankar's view I would say reflect the broader understanding that there cannot be any kind of normalcy unless and until there is some kind of uh, you know the situation in the border eases okay uh general malik the the view from beijing is everything that india is doing they are viewing it as you know india is just going closer and closer to the us axis whether it is through quad ipef today you had the first summit of the i2u2 that's india israel united arab emirates and us so the way beijing views it India is pretty much uh, an ally of the United States, even if it is not by name. Uh, that is true for both sides. While uh, I agree that India is moving closer to uh, the Western world, and uh, <clears throat> there has been greater cooperation starting with Quad onwards, but then uh, so is the case uh, as far as uh, China and Russia are concerned. We are also noticing yeah. that uh, China is moving closer to Russia and another thing I must mention, Zaka, uh, China has not stopped uh, 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 stop uh, has not stopped uh, supporting the terrorism from Pakistan. In fact, whenever we ask for any well-known terrorist to be declared as a global terrorist in the United right. Nations, they have blocked that. So their policy continues to be uh, anti-Indian as far as terrorism is concerned. And then, as I said earlier. Uh, unfortunately, we have made no progress at all uh, for the last two years. Although the uh, tension on the border started more than two years ago, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. But then uh, after the initial gesture from both sides, where we withdrew uh, to some extent, uh, there have been absolutely, once they have uh, once they have secured the Kailash Ray, thereafter they have made no progress and not shown any uh, willingness to make any progress. How worried, Ambassador Tragunia, should India be about this coming together, which many are saying is an inevitable coming together of uh, Beijing and Moscow? Of course, India has its own independent ties with Moscow uh, to the extent that we were the only member in the Quad uh, which did not vote against Moscow at the United Nations uh, Security Council or the General Assembly. Uh, if Russia and China are going to inevitably come closer together, uh, should India be concerned about that? Well, I have a different take on it, Zaka. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I have served in Russia twice, not once, and I know them rather well. You see, Russia is also a major power, irrespective of the fact that you may say it is decimated over time or whatever it is. But they still have this superpower, uh, at least the ambition. And therefore, even though because of the American pressure uh, and the way the U.S. policy has driven them into the Chinese arms to stop so to say, and uh, the, the partnership without limits or friendship without limits, the fact remains is that in the, in the uh, strategic mix, uh, Russia needs India to leverage China. And that is very much there. You can see it in the SEO, you can see it in the BRICS, you can see it in the bilateral context, you can see it in the regional context. And therefore, I feel that while they will continue to go ahead, wherever they have to counter the Western influence, but when it comes between Russia and China, because the Russians are also equally wary of the Chinese, because there have been problems in the past and there will be problems in the future. So I do not see that uh, uh, the Russia going all over. And we have seen it even during the Galwan crisis and thereafter. The Russians have been ready to assist us throughout. Chinese did not want us, not only the Americans, the Chinese did not want us to buy the S-400. But we have been supplying S-400. Uh, Aina Tanjan, after the Russia-Ukraine war and the, and the limits of that war, even for a big power like Russia, you've seen Europe consolidating in a way that we haven't seen in a number of years. Uh, the idea of NATO is now very much alive and kicking. The sanctions are beginning to bite. And of course, yes, the war is still continuing. And Russia's initial aims of overthrowing the regime, the Zelensky regime, uh, that had to be pared down now to just success in the east. Has that recalibrated Beijing's own position when it comes to Taiwan or possible, you know, a military adventure vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? 
And is that also making Beijing rethink its own sort of strategic partnerships and friendships uh, in, in Southeast Asia, in the ASEAN region, and also in Northeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis both Japan uh, and South Korea? No, no, not really. I mean, uh, the issue with Taiwan is not like uh, Ukraine at all. I mean, uh, the world, uh, you know, basically said uh, back in 74 that uh, Taiwan is no longer part of the United Nations. It's recognized as part of China. Uh, the, the issue is that there's a geopolitical game going on. Um, the previous speakers have pointed to the fact that it is a multipolar world. Uh, unfortunately, you still have the U.S. and, to a certain extent, some European powers kind of clinging to this notion that they're colonial powers, that they can do what they did in the past, which is divide and conquer uh, any kind of economic adversary that rises. You know, remember, India was 24 percent of the world's GDP before the British arrived. It was 4 percent after they left. It's very successful for them, not so much for India. And this was a, a tune that was repeated around the world. So I, I think most countries have to stand back and be very carefully calibrate okay. who is winning in these particular uh, issues. If it's uh, United Asia, that is the greatest threat there is uh, to you know this kind of clinging to a, a single pole uh, power. If you want to have multipolarity, there's got to be dialogue has to be trust, but that trust has to be spread around, and it's not simply dictated by one entity, whether it's the United States as the policeman of the world or whether the U.S. is able to transfer that to NATO and have uh, the Europeans pay for it. These are still the colonial powers. They're still used to dictating to well, other guess, countries. So the it's question worth is, asking, will they accept it? You know, what, what Vladimir Putin did, uh, I guess uh, that, that singularly contributed to the idea of that unipolar world or, or the U.S. being uh, the fulcrum of that unipolar world more than anything else in the last uh, many decades. But I want to go for, get a final word from Dr. Pratibha. I want to go back to where I started about the Dalai Lama. Uh, do you see India being more assertive by allowing him to visit Ladakh? The comments that he made, I found those comments very, very interesting, saying that, you know, I'm not against the Chinese people, neither are the Chinese people against me. So clearly making that distinction between the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, and the people of China, and again reiterating that what he wants is not independence from China, but autonomy within China. Yes, I think he has uh, made these distinctions before that uh, he doesn't, uh, you know, support independence. He's, he wants more autonomy. Uh, but I think from the Chinese perspective, the Chinese don't believe uh, you know, they see him with a lot of suspicion and uh, paranoia. If you see his, their statements on Dalai Lama, it's not very kind. Uh, so I think in, and the Indian position always been that we, unlike China, we consider him as an honored guest. We, he has sure. a huge yeah. positive, uh, you know, following in India and uh, he's free to do some of his activities. Uh, so I think uh, it, it is in some ways, even the Chinese statements is, is very similar to what they had uh, told us, uh, said in 2021, when uh, Nadir wished Dalai Lama his uh, birthday wishes. So I think okay. in some All ways, right. certain things are the same. And yes, you can make certain, uh, you know, assessments that yes, uh, if he's going to China, is it, is it something different? But I think Indian government position is that he's a friend. He's Given, uh, you know, the, the, the events leading up to the Corps Commander's meeting that happens this weekend, I, I suspect it would be only fair that we temper down our expectations on any kind of breakthrough uh, in that military talks. For the moment, I'll leave it at that. Uh, General uh, Malik, uh, Ambassador Trigonia, Aina Tanjan and Dr. Pratibha, thank you very much. Uh, let's shift focus from one neighbor to another. Sri Lanka is now in a state of emergency and its president, Gotabaya Rajapaksha, who's been on the run in exile, literally, from the country, he's now landed just moments ago in Singapore. He left the Maldives in a private jet, is what we're given to understand. Rajapaksha was supposed to resign yesterday. Instead, fled from the country, first landing up in Maldives. The Speaker of the Sri Lankan Parliament, Mahinda Yapa Abhayawardena, has said that the Parliament will resume after three days once Rajapaksha resigns from his post. Meanwhile, the Sri Lankan opposition is likely to propose a new name for Prime Minister. Meanwhile, in a statement, Singapore has clarified that Gotabaya has been allowed entry on a private visit. Neither did he seek asylum, nor is Singapore granting him any kind of asylum.
All right, we're just getting that breaking news. This has just come from the Singapore Foreign Ministry just moments after Gotabaya Rajapaksha landed it at the Changi Airport uh, in Singapore. Uh, it says, and I quote, Mr. Rajapaksha has been allowed entry into Singapore on a private visit. He has not asked for asylum and neither has he been granted asylum. Singapore generally does not grant requests for asylum. Purnima is now joining us live from Colombo. So what's the word in Colombo? Uh, clearly, Singapore doesn't seem to be his final destination. Where is he likely to go from Singapore? What's the word on the street in Colombo? Well, sources say that he's having multiple options open and only after he feels safe, uh, quote-unquote, uh, will he finally uh, submit his designation. But many say that at least for the interim period, he is likely to stay in Singapore. That's what local media here has been reporting, that Singapore at least for a few days and uh, that he uh, is likely to submit his designation uh, once uh, he uh, he is in Singapore and has reached a safe destination. But, you know, uh, what about Rajapaksha? Do you think Singapore will be his final destination? Do you also predict that he could even, uh, that there could be a delay in the designation wherein he could try to uh, try to travel to other places as well i don't think that gotabaya rajapaksha's final destination is singapore sometimes i feel that all the world is helping us at this moment he will not have any place to go uh, i think his final destination will be back in sri lanka one day not as the president as a jail in the jail he'll be in jail one day you know the uh, there's a delay in the resignation. He had promised to resign on the 13th of July, but that's not happening. At least do you foresee uh, uh, the announcement coming in any time now that he's landed in Singapore? Do you expect it to come any time today? We are. We are expecting. that. But that's what he said. He said that he will uh, hand over his uh, resignation as soon as he feels safe because he knows that uh, anywhere that he is not safe at the moment. Wherever he goes, he has been chased out. Nobody is expecting uh, like him to be in his country because it will be a threat. Wherever he is in that country, it's a threat for that country. So he, he, it, he has to, he has to, we are expecting his resignation. And also I, I would like to say we are expecting his resignation, but uh, even it, at this moment we don't uh, respect him or we don't say that he is our president. He has left us and gone. He has gone. Yeah. So they say that it's already a victory because uh, he had already uh, fled the country and that itself is a victory for the people's struggle. You know, it's raining in Colombo, but that is not stopping protesters from raising slogans. Uh, this is a scene at uh, the golf face where protests continue and despite rains, there are, you can hear slogans against uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksha Gota go home chorus only growing louder whether it's uh, whether it's a rainy day whether it's a hot day protests here continue for the 97th day back to you also very quickly Purnima what's happening in terms of uh, you know the opposition I believe that uh, there's going to be a meeting tomorrow and uh, the opposition could likely propose a consensus name to the speaker to be the next prime minister uh, what's happening on that front Well, an all-party uh, government uh, should be formed and that is going to be the next step. And opposition parties here uh, say that by 10 a.m. tomorrow, uh, the name that they would suggest as a prime ministerial candidate, that will be given to the speaker. Right now, discussions on, uh, are on on who could uh, uh, be chosen as the prime minister. So all the opposition parties are now trying to stay united and recommend a name for the prime minister's post. Remember, Ranil Vikramasinghe is now the interim president. Uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe has had uh, told the uh, speaker that uh, opposition parties should elect someone to be the pi prime ministerial candidate and that is going to uh, be the uh, uh, and that is going to be discussed now and by 10 a.m. tomorrow they will submit their recommendation to the speaker and they hope that by that time Gotabaya will finally resign the parliament which is supposed to convene tomorrow that is not uh, the parliament is not convening tomorrow because Gotabaya still hasn't resigned and that's the latest update that we are getting all right Purma we'll leave it at that uh, continue reporting for us from Colombia at the heart of these Aragalaya protests or the People's Peaceful Protest. Meanwhile, we're getting another piece of breaking news. Uh, the Jharkhand Mukti Morcha, the ruling party in Jharkhand, has decided to support the NDA's presidential candidate, Draupadi Murmu, in the presidential elections that are going to happen on Monday. Remember, Draupadi Murmu had gone uh, to Ranchi and met with not just Hemant Surain, the chief minister, but also Shibu Surain, the patriarch.
of the JMM uh, and of course the JMM its identity is is that of a tribal party and therefore it would have been extremely difficult for the JMM not to support a tribal candidate for the president of India Maria has more details on this so unexpected lines Maria Absolutely, Zaka. Uh, she comes from the same uh, tribal community, which is the Santhal. Uh, that is the reason why we did not see much of a surprise. Uh, she, uh, you know, Hemant Soren and Shibu Soren were left with little option because Jharkhand Mukti Morcha is the only tribal party of the country. Um, and she has also served as the governor of Jharkhand as well. So given the kind of equation that Hemant Soren uh, and uh, Shibu Soren had with uh, Draupadi Murmu and the kind of support that they did, did extend to her the moment she arrived in Jharkhand. It was on expected lines that uh, there will be more breaking of ranks. What is emerging right now, Zaka, is that in the opposition there is clear signs of a new political axis that is emerging because of the candidature of Draupadi Murmu. We have seen Udav Thakre break ranks with his allies in Mahavikas Agadi and back, back Draupadi Murmu. There there is also the support that came from TDP's Chandra Babu Naidu. And now the letter that has been issued by Jharkhand Mukti Morcha becomes important. It says very clearly that aap abgat honge ke agami rashtrapati chunao mein Jharkhand ki poorva rajyapal evam uh, adivasi mahila shrimati Draupadi Murmu umidwar hai. Azadi ke baad pehli baar kisi adivasi mahila ko rashtrapati banne ka gaurav prapt hone wala hai. So I think that specific point that she is a former Jharkhand governor and the first tribal woman president, all set to be the first tribal woman president, uh, JMM taking this call and making that announcement two days before the elections on 18th. And very quickly, you said uh, there are larger sort of political, uh, you know, maneuverings that are going on. Clearly, we've seen what what's happened in Maharashtra and now the Shiv Sena has also decided to back Draupadi Murmu. Now you have JMM deciding to back uh, Draupadi Murmu. What are the larger political maneuverings that are going on behind the scenes because of this candidature and this election? Yes, uh, so Zaka, you know, on the day uh, uh, JP Nadda made that announcement, it did not really come as much of a surprise because in 2017 as well, she was in that short list and then of course, uh, Ramnath Kovind had emerged as a dark horse then. What happened with the candidature of Draupadi Murmu is that many political parties do not want to be seen on the wrong side of the history because Yeshwan Sinha is a former BJP leader. So for all those who are backing him, they would write, rather be on the right side of the history and that is the reason why we are seeing all these maneuvering that is happening. Remember, uh, uh, you know, Jharkhand chief minister had traveled to Delhi. He had communicated his intent also to Home Minister Amit Shah. So it was only a matter of time perhaps that we would be seeing this movement and all is not well also in that alliance that is there in the government in Jharkhand as well, Zaka. So all, the, all that is not well. We saw that play out also uh, during the Rajya Sabha elections when it was a JMM candidate, uh, you know, despite having that meeting uh, with Sonia Gandhi, Hemant Soren went back to Ranchi and said it will be a JMM candidate, not an alliance candidate who will be sent to the Rajya Sabha. So let's be prepared for some surprises perhaps that could come from Jharkhand but for the moment the message that is coming from JMM another party that is breaking ranks is that All they right. would like to be on the right side of the history in this candidature of Draupadi Murmu and backing her. All right we'll leave it to that uh, significant decision this politically for uh, JMM and it could have ramifications beyond just this election cycle. Maria Shakil there reporting for us how JMM has now decided to back the candidature of Draupadi Murmu to be the President of India. With that, it's a wrap. In a moment, Akansha will join you with biggest exclusive tonight.